Good evening. I want to share with you a little bit about HP's strategy. I quite often get asked the question, what is HP? And I think what people are really asking me is what is HP's role in this changing IT world and what can HP do to help me with the challenges that I'm facing? And I think if we're going to answer that question, I think it's important to share with you some of the trends that we see in the industry. Some of our strengths and capabilities in dealing with the challenges that are faced. And it won't surprise you to know that we've got one eye on the future. So I'm going to look to share and give you some of the insight in where we think things are going. I am Rob McMahon. I look after cloud and automation software business in EMEA. And I think everybody around here would agree that right now at the moment we're in times of change. There's big shifts. There's massive plays and power shifts going on within the IT world. We're seeing a change in the way that we're consuming, the way that we're delivering, and the way that we're paying for services. This isn't new to us. We're all familiar with it, the 10, 15 year cycle, the mainframe, to, uh, to client services, to client services, to web 1.0, web 1.0, all the way up to mobility and um, web services. But what does happen when we get those changes is we get a shift, something opens up. There's new profit pools, there's new products, and innovation becomes really alive. It's a shining, shining star, it's its finest hour. But this change feels different. This change feels bigger, it feels more inclusive. It feels like IT is poised to change more and more industries. Because what we're feeling really is that IT is very important, very critical. It's almost the engine that powers the enterprise. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a new style of IT. We're seeing this new style emerging, being driven by cloud, being driven by mobility, and being driven by big data. And it's making some great promises. It's promising agility, simplicity, lower costs, faster speed. It's changing the way the technology is being consumed and delivered and it's changing the way that the end users are interacting with the technology. And what that means is we're getting a lower entry point. So John was asking you how many of you would change what you were doing if you, if you could start again and what percentage of that would you put into cloud. What this I think means to you, to your competitors, is that the competitors you have today may not be the same competitors that you have tomorrow. They might be people you've never even heard of. So we're living in the 21st century at home, but the moment we step through that door and we're into the workplace, we're going back in time. And that's a big challenge for IT. It's one of the biggest challenges we've faced in the last 15 years. We're being forced to accelerate, and John gave a great example with Ping, our applications and our web services. They put it to one side and they delivered it rapidly as a proof of concept. That's being driven by the need to keep pace with the demands which are coming from outside. And these demands are putting a great onus on IT. We're going to have to have a foundation, a new IT foundation that can deliver agility, that can deliver cost, that can deliver simplicity, and do all this and make it more accessible. So what's this foundation going to consist of? Well, there's going to be devices, there's going to be infrastructure and data centers, there's going to be software, and there's going to be services. Pretty familiar stuff, right? But we can't treat them on their own. If this foundation for the new style of IT is going to work, we need to treat them in unison. We need to bring them all together. We need to make sure that they're working as one. Now, why HP? Well, HP, we believe, is in a very strong position to partner with you on these things. We're the only people who can deliver devices, the only company that can deliver devices, infrastructure, software and services to the enterprise and also to the consumer. But don't panic. I'm not going to take you through our entire portfolio. I don't think there's enough wine in here anyway for us to do that. What I am going to do is focus briefly on software, because software is the glue. Software is the bit that hangs all this together, <coughs> gives the essential tools that you need to manage across platforms, to manage across delivery environments, 
to manage infrastructure, application life cycles, code releases, and all the information that goes with those. It's also about security and analyzing data, both structured and unstructured, big data. But I think we've probably had enough of the corporate PowerPoints by now. These slides, so time to move away from them. I'm going to tell you a little story that hopefully will show you some of the challenges that come around delivering cloud. I want to introduce you to my friend Joe. Now Joe works in a large enterprise and he's been tasked with delivering a cloud. We had the question earlier, what is a cloud? So Joe's sitting there and he's got to roll this cloud out. So let's talk to some of Joe's colleagues and find out what it is that he's going to have to do to deliver this. So he's got a large application team working in his, in his um, enterprise. Agnes runs test and development. And her role in life, I mean, she wants to excel, she wants to be good. She wants to deliver these environments efficiently and quickly. That's her, her reason to live. Very exciting person, Agnes. One of her customers is Jack. Jack is not very happy. He doesn't think he's getting enough response from Agnes. He doesn't think that she's delivering the service that he requires anywhere near fast enough. In fact, he's so upset, he's reached into his pocket and taken out his credit card. And Jack's the kind of guy that doesn't buy drinks. Yet he's buying from HP Cloud his own environment. So that he can go and he can do his development. But he still wants support from Agnes. He still wants them to help him out. Let's meet two more colleagues, Wendy and Jane. So, Wendy also runs the development environment. She's a little bit ahead of Jack. She's a little bit more cheerful. She's got hers running in Amazon Cloud. She also wants support. And Jane, poor Jane, Jane works on the production side of things. She needs to roll out the services that all of Agnes's organization are pulling together from all these various different service providers. And she needs to roll them out into her enterprise-grade private cloud. And she needs to do that quickly, and she needs to do it reliably. Well, this is production. She needs to make sure that it's being monitored and configured. She needs to make sure that the patch levels are being maintained, and that there's security and compliance. Because we all know, if you're non-compliant, it can get expensive. Wendy's also being measured constantly. Asked, how are you performing? You're not doing as well as those other guys. You might be doing better than Rackspace, but are you doing better than Amazon? Are you doing better than HP Cloud? It's a classic example of agility and cross cost pressures on a business, pushing them, pushing them hard. Do you remember Joe? He just wanted to roll out a cloud. So what did he do? Well, there he is, but he's not happy anymore. All those people underneath him causing him trouble, wanting different solutions, different requirements. Fortunately, Joe took the view of an application-centric cloud broker. So what does that mean? Well, he's got a catalog of services and systems in a central portal that delivers all of those functionality down to Jack and Jane. But it's not just for a single service provider, because we've already seen there's Amazon, there's HP Cloud, there's the internal public cloud, sorry, the internal private cloud, which is running on VMware. Perhaps there's some OpenStack stuff also happening. Being able to support all these various different clouds in that single point gives them the power to offer a cloud infrastructure that delivers the value to all of his various different customers. But of course he needs audibility, he needs visibility, and cloud isn't about provisioning a server. It's about managing the life cycle of that server. It's about patching it and upgrading it and making sure that the quality of service is there throughout the period of that application's lifetime. And of course, I think John also mentioned this, it needs to be flexible and it needs to be open. What if that grouch Jack goes and decides that he wants to go and use Rackspace? We need to be able to plug that service provider in to this cloud broker as well. What if we extend the private cloud, or we, or we have multiple private clouds within inside the organization, different security grades, different availability grades, being able to put those inside a single service portal. So Jack is now very happy. 
So I'm just going to change pace again. We've seen enough of Jack for the time being. And Joe. And Joe. Thank you. <laughs> and Wendy and Agnes. And the other one? Jane. So that's not the question, by the way. Which one did I not mention? Um, so what we have here is looking into the future. When I go down to speak to those clever chaps in Bristol and HP Labs and ask them and try and tease out of them, where are we going next? What's happening? What are you working on? What sneaky stuff are you building here that's going to excite the world? They always drag me back to the past. And they, tell me, and they take me on a little bit of a history lesson. And I'm not really one to challenge them. They're far more knowledgeable and wise than I will ever be. So I'm going to take what they tell me and the message that they deliver it and also give you a little bit of a history lesson on that as well. But I'll keep it very, very short, don't you worry. So in the 60s, we started some um, packet switch prototypes, um, which came out really being the, the birthplace of ARPANET and then ultimately the internet. But fundamentally, what we were doing at that point in time was we were allowing ubiquitous, uniform access to devices. You have an IP network with a device on it, and I'm on that IP network, I can get access to that device from anywhere in the world using standard protocols. Pretty straightforward. 25 years later, thanks to Mark Andreessen and the Mosaic browser, we came up with the web. Very, very similar, but looking at uniform, ubiquitous uniform access to data, information. If there's a web server anywhere in the world using standard protocols, I can use the network to get access to that information and, and therefore read it. So if you've got connectivity, if you've got information, the next logical step is functionality. And that's where we think the cloud really comes in. Whoops. Went one too far. Uniform, ubiquitous access to services. It's fundamentally what the cloud is all about. Now what's very important here is the relationship between the end user. Be it a teenager, be it a small company, a large company, be it a citizen or even a government. That end user just wants to understand the service in terms that they understand it in. They want to execute a task and have it delivered to them. The vast majority of people don't know about servers, networks, switches, data centers, support contracts, operational staff. Why should they? They want to execute a task, and that's all they want to know about. And that's the challenge for the cloud. The challenge is as a service provider, and that's a, that's a really key role, as a service provider, what do we do to make sure that all that complexity, all that complication behind delivering a service is hidden so that the end user is delivered the service in a way that they want to see it? I think that's really where we get to with the cloud. So we see many different types of service provider. We see multiple layers. I mean, if you think about delivering a box as a service, that's pretty much infrastructure as a service, very, very simple. But then multiple layers on top of that, each one adding more and more value. Until you get to a point where you've got this global infrastructure powering and supplying the cloud with layers of services and service providers building on top of that. And we're starting to see that today. So when you actually get beyond that base level, all these other service providers don't even own any infrastructure. They're just building on the value of the services below, building that up. Again, John sort of alluded to that again. Why would we invest, why would we invest and, and take the risk of having infrastructure when we can take the services from a service provider? And if we don't need it anymore, we turn it off. But we also see large enterprises also becoming service providers. Their private clouds are delivering services which will become competitive. There will be a revenue generating opportunity and these large enterprises will open up their private clouds and put them into the public. Multiple clouds and you end up 
with a marketplace of services. And with any market economy based on services, you have all the usual intermediaries. So we expect there to be brokers and to traders and aggregators all trading and dealing in these services. Because as soon as a service provider lowers his price, there's nothing to stop you as a consumer switching across, moving with the new service. So this is what we see as the end stage of cloud. Over one million service providers in this complex, highly dynamic environment. That was step three. What's step four? So you've got the net, you've got the web, and you've got the cloud. It's like a brain, but without any senses. What if we could take it and enable it to see, to hear, to taste, touch, smell? Wouldn't that be something? We could take the cloud, the web, the net and the cloud and work on that. And in order to do that, you need sensors. Sensors out there. Now there's already billions of sensors, but most of those sensors are pretty closed. They work on specific applications, they record data, they ship it in to the application and that data never goes anywhere else. What we see happening is a shift in that and that data moving from being centralized, maybe it's being anonymized, maybe it's being processed, maybe it's being projected, but moving into a central cloud environment where it can then be bought or provided for free. And what that does is give you ubiquitous uniform access to the real world. So in HP Labs, we're working on a project called the Central Nervous System for Earth. And what we're doing is we're working on, we believe there'll be over a, over a trillion sensors out there in the world, all types of different sensors. We think there'll be sensors, we're working on um, a thing called a Raman spectrometer um, in Palo Alto. And we're getting it so small that you can put it into a mobile phone. That's not a mobile phone, but it's about the same size. And what you can do with that is you can detect organic molecules. So there's a, a use case that they're discussing, which is quite fanciful, but I, I like the idea of it, in that you take your Raman spectrometer-enabled telephone, you wave it over your salad, it detects whether or not there's salmonella in it, and then you can make a decision on whether you want to catch salmonella or not. We're also working with Shell, and this is more about touch and feel. As you know, it's quite expensive to drill a hole and see if there's oil at the bottom of it. So what we've been doing is we've been building nanoscope accelerometers. Tiny, tiny, tiny little detectors. Because it's a lot easier to put these thousands of them across a field and a canyon and all sorts. There's a big lorry that drives around placing them out the back. And then let off an almighty bang, measure the tremors, and then do very granular seismic modeling. It's far cheaper to drill in the right place first time round. One trillion sensors out there. And that actually is, that is one of our uh, nanoscope um, accelerators. There's also talk of putting them on bridges and measuring the structural integrity of bridges. Which sort of brings me on to, well, where are these going to be? Well, they're going to be absolutely everywhere. Anywhere you can think to put a sensor offers up an opportunity for a business idea for a service to be offered. One of the ones I quite like is uh, putting them in the shorts of a rugby player so when he gets tackled in an international you can measure the impact in newton meters of the uh, opposition whacking him off the, uh, off the pitch. I think uh, Sky would have a field day with that and charts and graphs bouncing around the screen. So, this is quite a complex world. You've got all these sensors out there detecting different sizes, some of them yet to be invented, some very simple, two states reporting back once a year, some very complex, sending back HD video 24 hours a day. So there's going to be some form of local processing, some form of taking that data and doing something with it before we can start to load it up into the cloud. 
And when we talk about big data, today we think about email archives, we think about uh, web navigation records. Well, all of that's going to be dwarfed. When you start collecting the data from a trillion sensors and start putting that into cloud, that is truly big data. So you're going to need some form of analytical um, visualization cloud service platform, some form of making sense of all this unstructured and structured data. So wouldn't it be great if you could put an app store on that and make it open so that people can come and build their services on top of all this big data that we're gathering around the world, all this information, whether it be tackling a rugby player, the structural integrity of an airplane, the speed of a car traveling across a bridge. All these things put together, when you start to blend them, you start to get insights that we can't even begin to comprehend today how we would market these. But we envisage all the verticals that we saw previously having sensors coming back and linking in and tying with this. So what we've got here is really a complete stack. We've got big data, we've got analysis, and all this is done in a cloud environment. So as those services become demanded, they're automatically spun up and, and made available to the new consumers. There is a fifth stage, but I'm out of time. But if you track me down afterwards, I'll be very happy to tell you about that fifth stage. But before I go, I do have a question. A lot of the value we get out of cloud today is around just doing things that we're already doing a little bit faster, doing things that bit more agile. What I would like to ask you is how do you plan to get new value, value from things which are impossible today or that were impossible yesterday from the cloud? Thank you very much.